Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Kennedy School. My name is Nicholas Burns. I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School, and it's a great honor for Harvard University and for the Kennedy School of Government to welcome the President of Turkey, Dr. Abdullah Gul, <laughs> Mrs. Gul, to Harvard University. It's a great and positive occasion for them because their son, Mehmet, just graduated yesterday from Harvard College, so we congratulate him and all of the family on his graduation from our university. Um, we have long wanted President Gould to visit us here because he's an outstanding leader. He's accompanied today by the new Turkish ambassador, Ambassador Kilic, and his wife, uh, Turkey's ambassador to the United States, and by the Consul General of Turkey to New England. So we're very, very happy to have all of them here. I think all of you know a little bit about President Gul. He has served in every high position in the Turkish government as president of Turkey, of prime minister of Turkey, and of foreign minister. When I was a diplomat, I remember what a great and valued partner he was to the United States government as foreign minister, as he has been as prime minister and president. He's had a long and distinguished career in Turkish politics, and he's been leading Turkey at a time of remarkable growth in Turkey's role in the world. I think in all of our classes here at Harvard, if we might choose one country that has grown in its political, its economic, its uh, military, but also in its um, soft power, we would say that country is Turkey. Certainly in the Middle East, as an example of a democratic country, of a Muslim country, uh, to the rest of the Middle East. Certainly in the Balkans, where that part of the world needs to find peace and stability, certainly in Central Asia. We in the United States count Turkey as among our greatest friends and most loyal members of the NATO alliance. And so it is a real pleasure to welcome its president here today. Uh, the president has some remarks to make. Uh, when he finishes those remarks, maybe I'll, Mr. President, I'll, if, if you agree, I'd maybe ask one question. And then we have um, two microphones. Uh, and I invite uh, our students and I invite our guests to uh, line up at the microphones. I'll call on people to ask questions. Uh, but please join me in welcoming President Gould to Harvard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable school members, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. I am honored to speak in the historic atmosphere of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Kennedy School brings together some of the brightest talents around the world, including students and academics from my country. I would like to thank Professor Nicholas Burns a friend of many years, as he mentioned, for his kind introduction. I would also like to thank the Balfour Center for organizing this event. Ladies and gentlemen, one month from now marks 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. The 20th century had, in fact, Stand started with great achievement and high hopes for humanity. Then came the most destructive war in history. The Great War bred most extremist ideologies, new conflicts, and another world war. I'm very pleased to see that many historians are benefiting from this bitter anniversary to look back at the origins and the consequences of the First World War with a fresh insight. They offer a lot of lessons for the current and future leaders of the world. I believe the most important lesson is to realize that international relations are not necessarily a zero-sum game. There are ample opportunities for all of us to gain if we work together. To achieve that, 
we have to go beyond narrow interest perceptions and egoistical calculations. Our actions should be guided by wisdom, empathy, prudence, and foresight. Dialogue, diplomacy, and compromise are therefore the biggest assets that we have for a better common future. A historian, Professor Christopher Clark, named the leaders of the world in the eve of the Great War as the sleepwalkers. However, we, the current leaders of the world, have an advantage over them. A more democratic environment with a free press and a civil society, which did not exist then. They are becoming more and more influential, if not always instrumental, in alerting the governments to act responsibly against the risk of war. I hope that the future historians will not label our generation of leaders as sleepwalkers. Against this background, let us now discuss what chances remain for peace, stability, and sustainable development in Turkey's neighborhood with due consideration to international norms and rule of law based on human rights. In fact, President Obama was quicker than me to touch upon these issues the other day. It is because of 10 hours flight and eight <laughs> times zero separated us from the West Point Academy and other token of globalization. But I fully share the president's emphasis on cooperation against terrorism with key partners. I also took careful note of the pledge to preserve American leadership in the face of global challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin my analysis today with a positive note. Revitalization of the Middle East peace process by the Obama administration last year is a most welcome development. I was, like many others, very much encouraged by the start of direct talks between the parties, thanks to Secretary Kerry's efforts. Despite certain setbacks, this initiative remains the only basis for reaching a just and comprehensive settlement of this core issue. On the other hand, <coughs> promising news come from Tunisia, where the fuse of the Arab Spring lit. A new constitution is adopted in January with broad consensus. By the end of the year, presidential and parliamentary elections will be held. Tunisian political leaders and people who acted with utmost prudence throughout this process deserve our particular praise and support. Last but not least, the deal on Iran's nuclear program is a great opportunity, which provides a solid basis for parties to reconcile their differences and move forward. If achieved, it is in the best interest of all parties to keep displaying utmost diligence in a prospective post-settlement phase in Iran. The Roaming on its great state tradition, wisdom and common sense seem to guide Iran's behavior. Our position on this topic is clear. A world free from nuclear weapons remains our common goal and aspiration. The same applies to the Middle East. Dear guests, as I pointed out at the UN General Assembly last September, internal conflicts increasing they have implications for global peace and security. Today, peace and security are dependent on the maintenance of domestic order in each and every nation. For example, 
hopes arose after the Egyptian revolution as its democratic transition meant a lot for the region. Egyptians indeed succeeded in holding free presidential and parliamentary elections. The military coup that followed, however, signified a radical interruption in the democratization process. I personally would like to see Egypt return to normalcy and democracy through an inclusive political process with all legitimate political actors taking part freely. In this context, releasing political prisoners would help greatly to dialogue and reconciliation. For sake of Egypt's long-term stability and sustainable development, self-enclosure cannot be an option. Egypt deserves and is perfectly capable of integrating with the world. This may be achieved through upholding universal principles of rule of law, fundamental freedoms, and open market economy. I wish that the new leadership in Egypt considers breaking away with the dictatorship mentality of the previous leaders. If this can be achieved, Egypt can easily reverse the vicious cycle it has been in for decades. In Syria, the current regime keeps ignoring and violating Security Council resolutions, starves and bombs its own people. Aleppo, an ancient city in UNESCO's world heritage, now lies in ruins, just like much of the rest of the country. Besides, close to a million Syrians have taken refuge in my country. It is regretful to see a second UN special representative resign and the UN Security Council once again gridlocked over Syria in the last few weeks. Nevertheless, we should insist on a strong, resolute and coordinated action in helping and the great human suffering in Syria as well as the ever-growing threat of terrorism. The international community cannot continue escaping this responsibility any further. Dear guests, the South Caucasus has historically served as a trade and transport land bridge linking Europe to the Middle East and Asia. The region is also home to rich energy resources. Unfortunately, ethnic conflicts have kept this critical region from fully exploiting its potential. Today, the countries in the region are faced with heavy financial burdens because of arms race as well as due to the high cost of refugees and displaced people. Yet, it's time to move from the common conceptions of locking in walls towards gates of interaction and cooperation. This can only be done by consolidating dialogue, interaction, and interdependency. Turkey, Georgia, and Azerbaijan are making important strides to this end. We are mobilizing all our efforts for building a web of energy and transport links to enhance regional peace, cooperation, and prosperity. For further progress, Exploring the means to find a just and lasting solution to frozen conflicts, including Nagorno-Karabakh, is also a must. Armenia, with whom we share a common history and border, should also be in the region scheme. At this point, let me emphasize here that we approach neighboring Armenia sincerely and open-heartedly. I was the first ever Turkish president to pay a historic visit to Armenia in 2008 upon a kind invitation by President Sarkisya. Unfortunately, circumstances did not allow this beginning to run its complete course. 
But there is still hope to normalize Turkish-Armenian relations. Prime Minister Erdogan's message last month, paying condolences to the grandchildren of the Armenian who lost their lives in 1915 is an important step forward. The year 1915 is indeed the most painful and mournful year in the history of Anatolia. This is so for all the peoples of Anatolia and for many reasons. The tragedies of the First World War reflect our shared pain. To evaluate this period through a perspective of just memory is a human and scholarly responsibility. To this end, we opened our archives to all researchers. Achieving progress is not an easy task. Strong reciprocal will, joint efforts, and a good measure of mutual understanding are absolutely necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, the crisis in Ukraine started with an obligation on Kiev to make a choice between Europe and Russia. This should not have been done so. The Crimean Peninsula, the first hotbed of contention in the Ukrainian crisis, <coughs> is the motherland of the Crimean Tatars, millions of whom live in Turkey for decades. The international community, including Turkey, does not recognize the annexation of Crimea. Yet, there is now a new reality on the ground. The, today, the de facto Russian authorities are responsible for the well-being, security, and rights of the people in Crimea, including the Tatars. This does not relieve us of the responsibility to seek a political resolution to the crisis. A lasting solution is only possible on the basis of democratic rights and liberties, as well as the international norms about sovereignty and territorial integrity. Taking this opportunity, I would like to congratulate the new Ukrainian president, Mr. Poroshenko. Upon his shoulders lies a historical mission for the future of Ukraine. The way he manages the crisis will no doubt have wider repercussions on stability and security in Europe. I am sure he will serve most wisely and responsibly. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I want to draw some guidelines which I believe may lead us through the future. Needless to say, I have not invented this. Yet, they continue to shed light on our way forward in our region and elsewhere. First, peace and stability is the backbone of any effort to steer economic growth and development. And the key to achieve stability is the supremacy of law and, in today's world, an institutionalized democracy. Second, Confidence and predictability is what makes any system credible and worthy. A system most observant of transparency, accountability, highest legal standards, and equal treatment is therefore a must. The internal tire of sustainable peace thus goes through democratization, rule of law, improving human rights standards and free market principles. The biggest assets for countries like Turkey, which are in possession of little natural resources, but sizable populations, is human capital. In order to make the best out of this asset, one needs to combine the human elements with what I have just explained. This is what we have done in Turkey during the last decades. This goes hand in hand with the external dimension which calls on sovereign equality, territorial integrity, 
and international law. The international community must be united in terms of well thought transition and exit strategies before pursuing a certain course of action. Some of the ramifications of the mutant interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan are striking examples of mistakes in this regard. Yet similar mistakes have unfortunately been repeated in Syria and Libya, where chaos, terrorism, and human suffering unfortunately continue. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to the last part of my speech. Today, Turkey stands a safe haven in a troublesome sum geography. It is a country that reflects more than values and idols in this part of the world. Turkey understands the unique role it can play for lasting peace and prosperity in its wider region. To do that, Turkey has to keep its character as a forward-looking, dynamic, and pluralistic society. This is why we have invested heavily on human capital and upgrading our standards. Over the last decade, we made great strides and undertook comprehensive economic and political reforms. To be precise, raising the democratic standards for our young and dynamic nation had a multiple effect on our economic development. Our own experience shows that enhancement of the rule of law human rights, and pluralism as elements of good governance both feed and draw an economic development. They are, in fact, parallel processes that strengthen each other. Turkey's European vocation and membership negotiations with the EU were instrumental in this respect. This technical process must be seen to its end. I want to believe that in the meantime, Europe will overcome challenges such as economic crisis, illegal migration, and extreme right tendencies. Despite some fluctuations in the piece of reforms which raise questions about our good reputation, there will be no change in our path, nor in our direction or orientation. This is because democratic values, which are in harmony with our own belief system, are all up across the Turkish society, such that sometimes the society runs ahead of the politicians. Both political determination and ownership on this irreversible path towards further democratization and development is strong. This is evidenced by the strong record of economic growth and the steps taken within the process of reconciliation with our Kurdish citizens. Ever increasing participation of women in local governance and the public sector after lifting the ban on headscarves is another example. We are resolute in moving along this path knowing that there is still way to go. We will keep on upgrading our standards because this is the way to make our people happier, wealthier, and stronger. Both Turkey and our partners will win in peace, cooperation, and prosperity. Thank you very much. Yes. President Gould has um, agreed to answer your questions. And so I would invite uh, anyone who'd like to ask a question to the microphones. And Mr. President, as people line up, maybe I could just ask you briefly 
yes. to expand on the last point you made. From our perspective in the United States, President Clinton, President George W. Bush, and President Obama have all wished to see a strong Turkey yes. and a Turkey that's integrated and welcomed yes. by our European friends. Yes. You just made a very important statement. Do you think that Europe will reciprocate? And do you think the future will include Turkey as a member of the European Union? Yes, we always appreciate this part. United States at all the president, all the administrations, they really supported us in this direction. So I want to thank first this. Uh, as it's known, we are in negotiation process with the EU, but there are some political bodies which are artificial created on this way. We hope that this artificial problems will disappear and everything will continue on its technical cause. And at the end, I believe that we will successfully finish the negotiation process. Of course, the negotiation process, bringing, finishing the negotiation process, doesn't bring automatic membership. Right. There are few countries, they have decided to go to referendum. We will respect whatever they say at the end. But what we ask our friends in Europe that not to create artificial problem in front of our negotiation process. Let us finish this. We will work, they will watch, but we have to be given opportunity of course. And let us be finish, complete this negotiation process and then that the real decision for the full membership that will be a real political decision that will take in that time and the people will decide for this. Because in France, they decided to go to referendum. If that time, not this time, that time, if the French people thinks that Turkey is going to burden on them, right, they will say no. So we will just respect this. I don't know, maybe the Turkish people will think differently at that time. But first, let us finish, complete the negotiation process successfully. So we expect this uh, uh, to do. And uh, once more, I appreciate always American support to this direct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we'll go right to you. Great. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, my, I have a two-part question, but <laughs> um, to what degree would you say separation of powers are established in Turkey, uh, especially on the executive power, that is the checks and balances? And my second question is whether an independent commission would be established to investigate the recent scandals surrounding the prime minister? I got this. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me speak Turkish and she will translate to you. Biraz önce ben hukuk, demokrasi ve şeffaflıktan bahsettim. Dolayısıyla Avrupa Birliği ile müzakere yürüten bir ülkede muhakkak ki bu kurallar geçerlidir. Ee, son dönemlerde e, birçok iddialar söz konusu. Bunların doğruluğu ve yanlışlığı hukuk sistemi içerisinde muhakkak ki e, e, ortaya çıkacaktır. Bununla ilgili prosesler de devam ediyor. Bununla ilgili gerek Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi'nde e, e, gerekse e, e, dışarıda e, aşma komisyonları ve e, e, çeşitli davalar açılmış vaziyette hukuk sistemi içerisinde bunların hepsi neticelenecektir. Bazı sayın bakanlarla ilgili bu söylediğiniz e, soru. I was uh, talking about the importance of uh, 
the rule of law, democracy, and transparency earlier in my remarks. And these are all very important principles which are also valid in Turkey as a country which is also in a process of accession to the European Union. There are some allegations, as you say, rightfully or wrongfully, about some individuals and some issues, and those are all resolved, as they should be, within a process of law. And we have that process is running. There's a already some work going on in the Turkish Grand National Assembly, but also judicially as well. Some uh, research investigation commissions have been established. So these are all uh, carried out in due, with due process through the course of law. And uh, these men ones that you mentioned uh, involve some ministers. And they are all being carried out within the process of the legal system that exists in Turkey. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, my name is John Soylu. I'm a senior at the college. Merhaba, hoş geldiniz. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for visiting us here and um, for always being the voice of compromise and for your services. Um, my question is with regards to foreign policy. Um, El Maliki has been re-elected in Iraq, and as Turkey has gotten closer with northern Iraq, that has caused our relationship with Baghdad to worsen. I was wondering how it can be improved and how we can move beyond where we are now. The, the current uh, energy deals are sort of stalled because uh, the central government fears that this might pull northern Iraq away from, uh, the, uh, from the central authority. And I was wondering what Turkey's stance is and how you think we can improve this relationship. Yes. Petrolle ilgili. Kuzey Irak ve Bağdat hükümeti. Tabii Irak Türkiye'nin komşusu ve Irak'ta maalesef olup bitenlerin hepsi Türkiye'de tabii yakından hep ilgilendirdi. Irak halkı ne kadar çok sıkıntı çektiyse bunun yansımaları Türkiye'de oldu. Dolayısıyla her şeyden önce bizim arzumuz. Irak'ın en kısa süre içerisinde istikrarlı, huzurlu ve kendi kaynaklarını kullanabilen, kendi halkının zenginliği için kullanabilen bir ülke olması. Ve Irak'ın bütün halkını da Türkiye olarak, biz kendimizi hep akrabalar olarak görüyoruz. Kürtleri, Araplar, Türkmenler hep yakın, hep tarih boyunca bizim yakın, iç içe olduğumuz insanlar. Memnun <gülüyor> Of course, Iraq is a neighboring country uh, to Turkey, and what happens in Iraq is always of interest and concern to us in Turkey. And um, there have been many difficulties and challenges felt by the people in Iraq. And uh, we in Turkey, as a neighboring country, uh, feel those difficulties in, and challenges. And we hope that uh, there will be stability and peace uh, in Iraq soon, so that everyone, all of the people of Iraq, will have the possibility to enjoy all the resources that the country has. Iraq is important to us because we have very many historical relations. We have relatives, we're relatives with many of the people there, the Kurds, the Turkomans, the Arabs, are all uh, very much close to the Turkish people throughout our historical relations. Maalesef, şahit olduğumuz bu ara istikrarsızlık tam her şey normale dönmediği için bazı temel yasaların Irak meclisinden çıkmasını engelledi. Bunlardan birisi petrol yasası bildiğiniz gibi. Bunun nasıl e, ülkede paylaşılacağı ile ilgili tartışmalar söz konusu. Ama bir yandan da Kuzey Irak'ta çıkan e, gerek gaz, gerek petrol, enerji, bütün bunların bir şekilde e, kullanılması gerekiyor. Bu çerçeve içerisinde Türkiye ile e, Irak'ın bir parçası olan e, Kuzey Irak yönetimi arasında bazı e, görüşmeler yapıldı ve bu o, enerjinin, petrolün ve gazın e, Türkiye ve Türkiye üzerinden Avrupa'ya nakli söz konusu. Burada tabii ki Irak Anayasası takip edilecek. Irak Anayasası'na göre e, bunun e, yanılmıyorsam %84'ü e, merkezi hükümete geri kalan da e, federal parça olan e, Kürt bölgesine bırakılıyor. Dolayısıyla bununla ilgili bütün e, işlemler ve gelirler Irak Anayasası ne diyorsa bu çerçeve içerisinde gerçekleştirilecek ve 
Irak'ın merkezi hükümetin anayasadan gelen hakkı Irak adına bloke edilecek. Kesinlikle Irak anayasasını çiğneyici herhangi bir e, uygulama söz konusu olmayacak. Şu anda bunun çalışmaları biliyorsunuz ilerliyor. Because of the uh, instability or instability in Iraq, um, some of the laws uh, are have not been passed from the uh, parliament uh, in Iraq. One of them is what is known as the oil law, because there's still discussion as to how those resources are to be shared. On the other hand, there are resources, energy resources, gas, oil, in uh, northern Iraq as well, and they also need to be used exhausted. And so there have been certain discussions uh, with respect to how this energy, oil and gas, can be transported to Turkey, through Turkey, to Europe. Uh, but in all of these processes, the uh, constitution of Iraq is respected because according to the constitution, there's a certain distribution and allocation of the uh, resources, the income from the resources, which I believe is 84% for the uh, central government and uh, rest for the federal part for the uh, Kurdish uh, region. And uh, so these discussions were going on with the uh, administration in northern Iraq. And everything that is carried out will be within the framework and based on the uh, constitution of Iraq, so uh, the constitution will be respected and the rights of the central government will therefore be kept aside, blocked uh, for the use of the central government. And this has been uh, how the process has been ongoing. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm a scientist at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I would like to ask my question in Turkish, if it's okay for you. Please, and we'll just interpret it. Uh, ben Harvard Tıp Tıp Fakültesinden em Doktor Emre Halkın Diş. Bildiğiniz, geçen, bildiğimiz gibi şu anda gezinin yıl dönümündeyiz. 29-30-31 Mayıs. Ben ve 25 meslektaşım, 4 tane Nobel ödüllü meslektaşımız geçen sene Science dergisinde bir makale yayınladık. Ve sizin başında olduğunuz Türkiye Cumhuriyeti Devleti'ni 8 tane insanımızı öldürdüğü için, 90 tane insanımızı kafa travması yaşattığı için, 9 insanımızın gözünü kaybettirdiği için, ve binlerce insanımızı sokaklarda gaza boğduğu için protesto ettik. Fakat Türkiye'de şiddet sürekli devam ediyor. Günde üç kadın öldürülüyor. Dört işçi iş kazalarında katlediliyor. Roboski katliamında sizin başında olduğunuz ordu 34 insanımızı öldürdü. 17 tanesi çocuktu. Bunların hiçbirinin hesabı sorulmadı. Benim sorum şu. Siz Ankara'da yaşıyorsunuz. Kızılay'da Ethem Sarısülük başından kurşunla vuruldu. Onun katili dışarıda. Siz... Böyle bir devletin başında olmaktan utanmıyor musunuz? Ellerinizden kan akıyor, görmüyor musunuz? Nasıl yani utanmadan gelip burada bize demokrasi yalanları söylüyorsunuz? Sorum şu, nasıl geceleri rahat uyuyorsunuz? Berkin Elvan 14 yaşındaydı. Berkin Elvan 14 yaşındaydı. Sizin, Sizin, Sizin başbakanınız diyor ki 14 yaşındaki çocuk terörist diyor. Utanmıyor musunuz? Tamam anladım. Tamam. Thank you. Sen karışma. Sen karışma. Thank you very much. Tamam, so, this is my question, but please, so, no, but please translate my question. But I would like my question to be translated. We, we no, I got your question. We I understand. Yes, so, but I want other people to understand to my question. Okay. Şimdi siz ben de niye aldım? Tamam. I would like my question to be translated to the audience, please. Şimdi. I would like my question to be translated. Yeah, listen to me. Listen to me. I listen to you. No, it's your turn to listen is to me. Is it possible that my question is translated first? Tamam, dinle beni sen. Let, ben seni dinledim, sen de beni dinle. Kimse sana böyle soru sorma hakkı vermez öyle kolay kolay. Türkiye'de dayak yer. Tamam, dinle şimdi. Şimdi, e, sen insan. önce e, tabii ki bu gezi olayları, bunlarla ilgili ne kadar takip ettin, e, open mind, ne kadar takip ettin onu bilemem. Bildiysen söylediklerinde epey bir yanlış da var. Her şeyden önce ben Cumhurbaşkanı olarak gezi olaylarında hayatı kaybedenlerle ilgili Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi'nde yaptığım konuşmada bas sağlığı dinledim ve bununla ilgili üzüntülerimi bunları gayet açık bir şekilde paylaştım. Bunu önce bilmen gerekir. The question was, um, gentlemen from the medical school, Harvard Medical School, Emre Altındiş. Evet, yes. um, I, I have a question. This is uh, these days, 29th, 30th, and uh, 31st of May, happen to be one year since the events at uh, Gezi Park. And uh, last year there were four uh, Nobel laureate uh, colleagues. Uh, who uh, published an article in Science uh, where we mentioned, and I was one of them, where we mentioned uh, 
that uh, eight people died in the Republic of Turkey, where you are president, and 90 people uh, suffered head traumas, nine people lost their eyes, and thousands of people were gassed because they were protesting. And uh, there were, uh, every day, the violence is still ongoing in Turkey. Three women are killed per day and four workers per day. Also, the government or in the country which you're president, president of has, has seen the events in Roboski where 34 people were killed, 17 of them children, and none of these events have been taken to account. You live in Ankara, in Chankaya, and close to Chankaya there is a district called Kızılay where a person named Etem Sarusülük was killed. So there's still bloodshed in your hands, and how can you talk about democracy to us? Aren't you ashamed of speaking of democracy? How can you sleep uh, safely and tightly and happily at night, at night because a, go a boy named uh, Berkin Elvan, 14 years old, was killed, and your prime minister is still not uh, is still not accepting this. The president responds, uh, "You can ask these questions, but of course there has to be a certain way in which these questions have to be asked properly." Gentleman replied by saying that I would be beaten if I were asking these questions at another location in this way. Uh, now, you have s said to me some words about what happened last year, but uh, I don't know if you followed everything that has happened during Gezi events, and I don't know whether you followed them with a fully open mind, because there are quite a number of things which you say which are quite wrong. First of all, let me say that as president, after the events in Gezi, uh, when I was inaugurating the Turkish parliament, I mentioned those people who died during the Gezi events by expressing my condolences to them. E, ayrıca söylediğin şeylerde tabii çok e, doğru olmayan e, sözler var. E, her gün üç tane kadın öldürülüyor derken bunlar 70 milyonluk ülkede maalesef olmaması gereken adi olaylar. Bu başka bir ülkede de var. Bunları tutup bunların hepsini e, siyasi e, cinayetler bir takdim etme bunlar doğru şeyler değil doğrusu. Bunu da e, önce bilmen gerekir. Also, for example, you mentioned that every day three women are killed. These are things, of course, which should not happen in a country of 70 million, but they do happen. But they are some murders, ordinary events, other ordinary crimes, in other words, not necessarily political murders. So I don't uh, think that representing them in the way that you represent would be correctly expressing the political situation in Turkey. Bu söylediğin olaylarla ilgili bu olayların ilk başlangıcı, ilk ortaya çıkışı, Çeşitli e, çevre şikayetleriyle ilgili başlayan bir olay. Ama ilk bir iki gün içerisinde bu olay doğru şekilde konten edilemeyince Türkiye'deki bütün illegal örgütler bu olayı istismar için sokağa döküldüler. Bu illegal örgütlerin neler olduğunu burada saymama gerek yok. Bunların bir kısmı Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'ne terör listesinde olan illegal örgütler biliyorsun. Ve... Bütün bunlar bu sokak olaylarında maalesef polis de hepsi illegal olarak bu olaylar olunca maalesef bu tip olaylar ortaya çıktı. Bunların hepsi tabii ki üzücü. The events uh, were started or did start as uh, events which had to do with the environment. There were some environmental concerns. But in a few days' time, because uh, the, uh, they were not properly and correctly contained, the illegal uh, organizations came about and they started trying to exploit what happened and they came out on the streets. I'm not going to list who these illegal organizations are. Some of them are also included in the uh, US terror list of terrorist organizations. And of course, when these events started growing in the way they did, the police started uh, getting involved. And as a result, because of the uh, presence of those illegal organizations, the events really got big and uh, we saw some of these unwanted and very sad consequences. Well. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. We have time for two more questions, I think. So Thank I'm you. sorry we won't be able to have the president answer all of them, but he has to leave at 11.45. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, thank you for your earlier remarks. Uh, my name is Nicholas Anasashvili. I'm, um, as of yesterday, graduate of the Kennedy School. I wanted to ask you a question um, about Turkey's uh, relationship with Russia, and I'll ask you one general question, and if, if, if I may, a more specific one. Uh, second one. Uh, first, uh, you mentioned uh, that peace and security was um, necessary for economic development. I was wondering what are the frameworks that Turkey, um, under which Turkey could negotiate with Russia to um, 
to develop to uh, what are the frameworks for Turkey and Russia to negotiate uh, and to work together for uh, peace and security in the region. And second, more specific question is, um, Turkey is a um, um, Black Sea uh, naval power, and as you probably most certainly know, uh, Russia um, is about to purchase uh, two um, powerful warships, Mistrals, from uh, France, um, which are aircraft carriers, and Turkey is also a member of NATO, and I'm wondering if there are any negotiations going right now between Turkey and France or within NATO that Turkey participates in to negotiate with Russia about this? Thank you. Two questions will be asked to you, Mr. President. Nicolas? Last name? Anasashvili. Anasashvili. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. I'm a student of Harvard University. Türkiye ile Rusya bir arada barış ve güvenliği sağlamak için neler yapabilirler? Nasıl bir çerçeve içerisinde çalışabilirler? Ve bu konudaki görüşlerinizi rica ediyorum. Türkiye, Daha, Rusya. Türkiye ile Rusya. Daha spesifik sorum. E, tabii ki e, Karadeniz çok önemli ve burada bir e, deniz gücü olmak çok önemli. Türkiye için de bu çok önemli. Diğer taraftan bilmiyorum biliyor musunuz? Büyük ihtimalle bildiğinizi düşünüyorum. Rusya'nın iki tane çok kuvvetli savaş gemisi Fransa'dan satın alacağına dair bilgiler var. Bunlar uçak gemisi olacak gemiler. Dolayısıyla oldukça önemli bir etki yapacaklar. Tabii Türkiye NATO'nun da bir üyesi. O yüzden merak ediyorum acaba NATO içerisinde veya Türkiye ile Fransa arasında benzer bir konuda bu gemilerle ilgili olarak bir müzakere, bir görüşme var mı ya da ne yapılıyor? Türkiye tabii Rusya ile komşu, denizden komşu. Aynı bölgenin ülkeleriyiz ama aynı paklarda değiliz. Özellikle Soğuk Savaş döneminde. Türkiye, NATO'nun e, kuzey-güney e, kanadını e, temsil eden bir ülke olarak bütün hür dünyayı o zaman komünizme karşı koruyan bir ülke. Dolayısıyla aramızdaki ilişkiler bizim, e, ikili ilişkiler, e, bölgenin e, kalkınması ekonomik ilişkiler, bölgedeki problemlerin suhuletle çözümü konusunda Karadeniz'in, İstikrarlı bir e, deniz olması konuda tabii ki yakın temaslarımız, işbirliğimiz var. Son Ukrayna, Kırım meselesi de dahil olmak üzere. E, Karabağ'ın, Azerbaycan'ın işgal altına topraklarının kurtarılması. Bütün bu konularda Rusya'nın şüphesiz ki e, sözü var ve bu konularda Türkiye-Rusya ilişkileri değerli, önemlidir. Of course, Turkey and Russia are neighbors across the sea, but uh, we have not been on the same side. During the Cold War, uh, Turkey was part of the southern flank of NATO, uh, defending, protecting the free world against communism at the time. But of course, we have bilateral relations with Russia, and we continue to pursue those relations. And we also have contacts with respect to how we can ensure uh, stability uh, in the Black Sea region uh, broadly, and more recently, the part of that discussion has been what happened in the Ukraine with Crimea. And uh, we also have um, other co contacts and relations with Russia with respect to what can be done in other, with respect to other conflicts in the region like the occupied territories in Azerbaijan of Karabakh. It's because Russia has a say with what is going on in the region as well. France and Russia are selling Türkiye'den ziyade Avrupa Birliği ve e, NATO içerisinde Amerika Birleşik Devletleri biraz o seviyede e, bir e, diplomasiyi e, meşgul ediyor bugünlerde. Netice ne olacak? Tabii bilemiyorum. E, Ambargoların uygulandığı bir dönemde e, Ukrayna politikasından dolayı e, bu o, gemilerin satışı ile ilgili tartışmalar sürüyor. With respect to the ships uh, to be sold by France to Russia, I'm aware of it, as you say. But of course, this is not a Turkey-specific discussion. It's more an EU, NATO, US, uh, um, you know, broader discussion on the diplomatic level. Of course, the discussions are going. It's I'm not in a position to say, you know, how they will result. But uh, it is an important discussion uh, in this period where we have sanctions because of the uh, Ukraine policy of uh, Russia. But it's something that we will have to see going forward. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm, I apologize. We only have time for one more question because we have to bring this session to a close at 11.45. So you have a last question. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your visit and speech. My name is Aysun Demircan. I am one of the Turkish students who has just graduated from Harvard MBA. Um, so during your remarks, you mentioned how important the internal peace, both for the economic growth and also for global stability and peace. So actually, my question has just two small pieces. Uh, first of all, uh, what are the biggest challenges that you think, uh, as Turkey, we should overcome going forward to have a sustainable internal peace? And secondly, depending on your experience, what would, what would be the key lessons that you think can be drawn both for the future, hopefully, future leaders of Turkey for us, and secondly, for the other countries specifically in the region and also globally for the other countries. İki sorum var. İsmim Aysun Demircan. E, dün itibariyle Harvard'da MBA'den mezun oldum ben de. Ve siz konuşmanızda iç barışın ekonomik büyüme için çok önemli olduğundan, ayrı zamanda küresel barış için de önemli olduğundan bahsettiniz. E, Türkiye açısından iç barışın e, sağlanabilmesi için ne gibi zorluklar var? Bu konudaki görüşlerinizi almak isterim. Ayrıca gelecekteki liderlere, bizler gibi genç olan insanlar, gelecekte lider olabilecek insanlara ne gibi dersler, ne gibi öğretiler çıkarmalıyız? Bizler hem Türkiye hem bölge hem dünya için genel olarak soruyorum bu soruyu da. E, tabii her şeyden önce e, siyasi gerginlik, siyasi tartışmaların e, biraz sert olmasıyla iç barış dediğimizde bunu iç, bunu bir iç kavga şeklinde sunmamak gerekiyor. Çünkü buna tercüme ettiğimizde çok farklı bir anlamda çıkabilir. O bakımdan Türkiye'deki siyasi kavgaların, siyasi mücadelelerin biraz sert olduğunu, biraz kırıcı olduğunu ve bu çerçeve içerisinde tabii ki halkın da zaman zaman bu çerçeve içerisinde tarafların tutarak kutuplaştığını görmek şeklinde doğru bir tespit yapmamız gerekir. Yoksa sanki çatışma, kavga ve bir düzenin olmayışı gibi bir anlam çıkar. Bunu bir düzeltmem gerekir müsaade edersen. Let me start uh, by making a semantic uh, observation. You know, we, when we talk about a tense political environment, uh, sometimes, and use the terms like internal peace, it's as if there is no internal peace, which means there's some sort of internal fighting or struggle. I think uh, in the translation especially, it comes across as, a, you know, a misrepresentation of what we are talking about in terms of the political climate in Turkey. We do, it is true that we have a very harsh and rather acrimonious political climate in Turkey, which leads to polarization on the part of the people, uh, and uh, that uh, creates some discussion and debate, very harsh and acrimonious at times. But this is in no way a, a conflict or a struggle in terms of being opposed, you know, in terms of being a, um, an antonym of internal peace. Let me make that observation and then answer your question. Çoğul, siyasi farklı siyasi partiler olacak, farklı görüşler olacak ve bunlar yarışacaklar birbiriyle. <gülüyor> Yarışırlarken işte maalesef bazen e, bugünlerde belki, e, şikayet ettiğiniz e, e, daha e, kırıcı ve e, zaman zaman daha yüksek tansiyon söz konusu oluyor. Ama neticede bunlar. Demokrasilerde nasıl halli oluyorsa öyle halli olacaktır. Seçimler olacaktır ve seçimlerde neticede millet nasıl ülkenin kimler tarafından idare edileceğini ona göre bir karar verecektir. Ve ondan sonraki tabii her şey yine hukuk çerçevesi içinde olacaktır. Türkiye'de kurumların çalıştığından bir şüpheniz olmasın. Ee, özellikle e, hukuk kurumlarının bir karar yanlış bir şey söz konusu olursa bununla ilgili şikayetler mahkemelere gider. Mahkemelerin kararları daima üst mahkemelerin itirazına açıktır. Türkiye'deki nihai karardan tatmin olmazsanız Türkiye Avrupa İnsan Hakları Mahkemesi'nin taraf olan bir ülke olduğu için vatandaşlarına Avrupa İnsan Hakları Mahkemesi'ne gitme hakkını vermiş bir ülkedir. Dolayısıyla bütün bu konuştuğumuz Şikayetler 
vatandaşlarına Avrupa insan haklarına gitme hakkını veren ve o mahkeme kararını tanıyan bir ülkeden bahsediyoruz. Bu çerçeve içerisinde eminim ki uzakta olunca bunları görünce daha çok etkileniyorsunuz ama bunların hep geçici olduğunu doğrusu söylemek isterim size. Thank you. Pluralism is of course part of uh, democracy and in any democracy you will have political parties, you will have a competition uh, amongst them or between them and uh, this is how the process works. But we see sometimes uh, in Turkey too at the moment that there's a lot, there are lots of complaints and the tensions are sometimes rather high and the debate is very acrimonious. Uh, but these happen in democracies and uh, the way out is through elections where the people express their will, they elect the people who will govern them. And of course, that is one aspect of things. The other aspect is due judicial process. The institutions in Turkey are uh, running, they're operating, they're, you should have no doubts with respect to that. Our legal institutions are in place, and if there is any problem or complaint, people can go to court, courts take their decisions, and if uh, that decision is not accepted by one of the parties, it's possible to appeal to higher courts, uh, and it goes all the way to the highest courts of the land, and and even that is not the end of the legal process because Turkey is a part of the European Convention on Human Rights whereby it allows its citizens to take their complaints to the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, so this, this is a process that is ongoing. I know from, perhaps from the outside when you're away, things look perhaps a little differently and the impact, the effect is somewhat different. But one has to remember that Turkey is a country which has allowed its people to go all the way to the European Court if they think something is not right in their own country. So I I believe that what we see is a temporary phase and we will go over this phase and it will, you know, things will change over time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, I want to thank you for being here. Unfortunately, we don't have time for other questions, but I wanted to thank Elaine Papoulias and the Center for European Studies. She's a great friend of <laughs> Turkey. She was the co-sponsor and Catherine Kluver of our Future Diplomacy Project. They organized this session. I want to thank you for, respond for your speech, for the ideas in it. And I want to thank you for responding to all the questions. It was a free exchange of ideas. You responded with precision and dignity. Uh, and we are honored by your visit to Harvard. And thank we you. count you as one of our great friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Dear friends. Well done. Dear friends, we kindly ask all of you to remain seated while the President and his delegation is leaving the room. Değerli arkadaşlar, Cumhurbaşkanı ve delegasyonu odaya